can answer questions throughout, but also um, at the end of the presentation. Um, so what is asthma? So asthma is a chronic disease that affects the airways and the lungs, meaning that um, people with asthma have asthma forever. It's not something that can go away. Um, but something that we teach is that with proper care, you can uh, manage your asthma and live a completely normal life. Um, there are three things that we always focus on, and that is monitoring symptoms, knowing what your symptoms are and how to avoid um, getting them, and then avoiding triggers. So knowing what triggers could be affecting your asthma and causing asthma attacks and finding ways to reduce those. And then medication. So knowing what medication to take, but also taking that medication properly. Um, this is a, a video that we found that does a pretty good job of explaining exactly what's happening during an asthma attack, as well as what the medications are for asthma and how they work in your lungs to help you prevent an asthma attack. Jocelyn, can you make that any louder? It's hard to hear. Are you guys able to hear? If not, I can kind of tell you what he's saying as we go. I'm having trouble with the audio on my end. Okay. Um, we can just go, Brittany, do you want to just go over it and I can go over yeah. the, the, the parts. Okay. Oh, it does have the audio down at the bottom. Okay. So he is basically showing, you know, your lungs, they, they branch and they branch and they branch down to the smallest of branches, which are so small that you need a microscope to see them. And so he's focusing in on one single bronchular to show you what your lungs looks like. So this is the inside of your lung, um, your airway, and then these are the um, smooth muscles that go around the outside. So normal airway, it's nice and open. The muscles are nice and relaxed. It's easy to breathe. You don't have any problems. Um, during an asthma attack, the bands around the outside, when you're exposed to a trigger, get really, really tight. And these are the muscles around the outside, which makes it really hard to breathe. Um, you also have a lot of swelling in the middle. Um, and this also makes it even more difficult to breathe, as well as an increase in mucus. So the first kind of medication that would help with this is your rescue inhaler. Your rescue inhaler works in just a couple of minutes, but it only lasts for a few hours. And what the rescue inhaler does is it works on those um, smooth muscles around the outside to loosen up so that you're able to breathe a little bit easier. The second medication is your controller medication. This is the one that you take every single day, and this one works over days and lasts much longer. Um, so your controller medication is going to help that swelling and that inflammation that's inside of your lungs um, to decrease so that your airways are open all the time. This way, when we, you are exposed to a trigger and you do have those muscle tightening, you're either, it's easier to breathe um, because the inside isn't swollen and inflamed. Uh, 
Okay, sorry about that. Um, we should check that that worked beforehand. Um, and we'll talk more about those medications in a little bit. Um, but yeah, so that is kind of like what is happening inside your lungs and what's happening um, when you're having an asthma attack. Um, so, oops, sorry. Uh, asthma is pretty common. Um, in the state of Utah, one in 10 adults have asthma and, in, and one in 15 children have asthma. Um, in the, I think, uh, I believe it was called the Utah State Health Update uh, from 2021. It stated that asthma was a number one health condition for students in the state of Utah. So it is very prevalent here and the number is just going up. It's not getting any better. Um, it's not only going up in Utah, but nationally as well, but our numbers are higher than the national average. Um, again, no one really knows exactly why that number is going up, but there's different things that could be um, causing these numbers to go up. And that is just kind of like uh, the air pollutants outside, um, you know, low birth rate, obesity, um, exposure to like smoke and vaping, um, things like that are uh, a reason that it could be going up. Also with asthma, mm -hmm. it is underdiagnosed um, and undertreated. So um, our, the numbers are high, but that's just for the people that are diagnosed, not for the people that are suffering with asthma symptoms that have yet to be diagnosed. Um. Of the people who have asthma in Utah, almost 60% of adults have severe uncontrolled asthma. And in children um, who are diagnosed with asthma, almost 50% are uncontrolled. And this is a problem because that means that they're not living their best life. They're not doing all of the things that they would like to do or that they could be doing. And this can be more, both mentally, financially, um, and physically limiting on the things that they are doing. And when we talk about uncontrolled asthma, we are defining it as having frequent symptoms that interfere with your everyday life. So just a, a note on that. Um, some common symptoms. Uh, so the most common symptom that people with asthma have is coughing. Um, People also have shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, so feeling like they can't catch their breath. Um, wheezing, um, so hearing when you're breathing, you kind of hear that whistling or squeaky sound. Um, chest tightness or pain, so kind of feeling like someone like, is squeezing your chest or like sitting on it. And then waking up uh, during the night or earlier than normal because of coughing or wheezing. So, um, these are the most common symptoms, but it presents different with every person. So um, some people might have all these symptoms, while others only just cough. Um, so that's something else to keep in mind as well, that um, it doesn't necessarily look the same. Uh, we talk to different families who have people, multiple people in their family that have asthma, and most all of them, their asthma symptoms are a little different. So Um, some emergency symptoms are retractions. Um, this is especially um, prevalent in children, like little children, when they're breathing so hard that their chest is actually sinking in. Um, if your face turns pale or gray, um, if your lips or fingernails start to turn purple or blue, if you're unable to say more than a short phrase because you're having such a hard time breathing, you've got such shortness of breath, um, or if you've taken your rescue inhaler and your symptoms aren't getting any better, these are all signs of um, an emergency and you want to get to the hospital as quickly as possible to the emergency room. You don't want to, you know, wait and see, especially with little kids. You want to make sure that you get medical treatment right away. Okay, so triggers. Um... When I mentioned managing your asthma, this was the second part, is kind of knowing what your triggers are. Um, so I've kind of wrote down some of the most common ones. So pollen, mold, tobacco smoke, pets, exercise, pests, oops, sorry, uh, meaning um, like cockroaches and rats, uh, changes in temperature, strong emotions, and respiratory infections or other illnesses are all different things that can affect your asthma. Um, 
when we do home visits, a lot of the times we ask people and they say they don't have any triggers. And most of the time, it's just that they haven't noticed what those triggers are. Um, so it's really important to know what possible triggers could be so that when you are having an asthma attack, you can avoid them um, or move away from them, but also in general, just trying to find ways to reduce that. Um, but yeah, so those are the most common ones. And the same with symptoms. Uh, every person's a little different. So some people might experience all these as their triggers, while other people might just have like pollen or exercise or just strong emotions. Um, so every person's a little different when it comes to um, their triggers. Um, work, workplace triggers. Besides our bedrooms, sleeping, work is probably the place where we spend the most amount of time. Um, so it's really critical to know what your triggers are, where you work. And again, this is going to be a little bit different for everybody, depending on where you work, depending on what your triggers are. But some of the most common ones are latex gloves, um, people that have allergies to that and are susceptible, um, dust, strong smells. And this can be anything from the industrial cleaners that they're using in the workplace. Um, if the person next to you has a really strong perfume or cologne or hairspray, um, and then air quality. And air quality is both inside and outside. Outside, it could be things like um, the wildfires, the inversion, the bad air quality days, pollen, um, outdoor allergies like that. Indoor air quality can be, again, those strong smells. Um, it can be inadequate, um, oh, geez, I just lost the word, I'm so sorry, um, airflow in your office, dust. Um, so just be mindful of, you know, when you're having an asthma attack, what's around you so that you can become familiar with those. And also if you're having these, you know, try to talk to your coworkers about those triggers, maybe asking them to um, not wear perfume on the days that you guys are working together or just being aware of what they are and trying to avoid them. Um, so during our visits, we go into extreme detail on how we can reduce these triggers, but I just wrote kind of some of the basic ones. So cleaning often, um, just cleaning often and properly is a big way to reduce a lot of different triggers. So it helps with like pets, it helps with dust, um, it helps with like mold. Um, so just trying to figure out the best way to clean. Uh, we always encourage people to um, use like a HEPA vacuum, use microfiber cloths, um, and just trying to, you know, reduce those triggers. Um, but along with clean often is using those natural cleaning products. And Brittany touched a little bit on that. Um, it's a little hard to, you know, in a workplace setting, telling people to use different cleaning supplies, just because I know that's a little trickier, but at your own home, you can find different um, ways to clean um, using more natural products. Um, if you just go online, there's a ton of different recipes on how to um, clean different like uh, appliances and different parts of your home using just household items like salt, baking soda, uh, lemon, um, vinegar, things like that, things that won't be harsh and um, are also just kind of safe for the whole family. Um, we also have copies of those, um, of a, a bunch of different recipes that we can share with you as well. Um, and then also checking air quality before going out. Um, we know that Utah doesn't always have the best air quality. Um, so I don't have asthma, but I'm still constantly checking my weather app because it has a little section that talks about air quality, just to make sure that um, I'm not spending too much time outside during a time that um, the air is extra bad. So we always encourage people to always check the air quality before going out and spending too much time outside. Um, and you can easily do that on like a weather app, but you can also just Google like your city or the city you're going to and, um, and just seeing how the air quality is going to be that day. Um, also just kind of quitting smoking, um, or being, or if someone in your family smokes or vapes, helping them quit smoking is a huge thing. Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, being exposed to, um, tobacco smoke can be a huge risk factor. Uh, with asthma. So 
Uh, and then when you do have asthma, it can be a huge trigger as well. So um, we always encourage people to quit smoking. And the state of Utah has a great program called Way to Quit that um, is completely free and will help people um, with that process. Okay, so you talked a little bit about this before. Um, it's really important um, to take your medication um, the way it's prescribed and also knowing what your medications are and what they do. So your controller medication is the one that you're gonna take every single day, even when you're feeling good. Um, you always wanna be proactive with your controller medication. And this one's helping with the swelling and the inflammation inside of your lungs. Um, so that when you do have an asthma attack, you're exposed to a trigger, you're already one step ahead of the game because your lungs aren't inflamed. Um, the other medication is your rescue medication, um, the albuterol. And this is the one that you're gonna take when you have an asthma attack. Um, this one acts fast and relaxes the smooth muscles that are squeezing your airways. Um, this one you can also take if you know that you're going to be exposed to a trigger, you can preemptively take it. Um, if you know that you're going to have an asthma attack when you exercise, um, you can take it before. Or if you're going to go to your friend's house and they have cats and cats are a trigger, you can take it before you go to try to minimize um, your asthma attack when you're going to have those exposures. Okay, so what to do during an asthma attack? So, um, and this is so helpful. I don't know how many of you actually have asthma or if you're, you know, just know people that have asthma, but this is just helpful to always know, um, just to help yourself, your family, and then the people around you. So the first thing is just give, uh, or, give or take the medication as directed. Um, it's important to always carry your rescue inhaler with you um, just because you never know when you're going to be exposed to a trigger or when you're going to have an asthma attack. So always have your medication on hand and then take that as directed um, when having those symptoms. Um, the next thing is to move away from anything that may be triggering those symptoms. So if you are uh, next to an animal or you're outside and it's a bad air quality day or something like that, then going back inside or moving away from the animal or you know, any, any situation that could be triggering those symptoms. Um, the next step would be to sit up and remain calm and then take slow, steady breaths, which it's easier said than done, especially when you're having an asthma attack. The last thing sometimes people can do is remain calm, but it's really important to, to do so just because then you'll be able to um, be breathe as efficiently as possible, especially as, you know, your lungs are... Um, you know, the muscles are getting squeezed and you have that inflammation. Um, next step, if you have any asthma emergency signs, seek medical care. Um, Brittany went over those emergency symptoms, but make sure that you remember those. And if you do notice that with anyone that is having an attack or yourself, then, you know, kind of going straight to, to a hospital or just seeking any medical attention. And then the sixth uh, step would be if it's a child that's having an asthma attack, never leave them alone. Um, I usually like to tell people that even if it's an adult, don't leave them alone if possible, um, just because it is a scary situation. And the last thing someone wants to do or be uh, is alone when, um, you know, they're suffering an asthma attack. So just remember these steps. Um, and then that will be helpful, especially when when going through something like this. Okay, um, so we've kind of talked a little bit about uncontrolled asthma. So controlled versus uncontrolled asthma, there's a couple of different ways that you can know if you're controlled or not. Um, if you're using your quick relief, your rescue inhaler more than two times a week, um, that means you're probably not as controlled. And that's not, like if you're taking it before exercise um, preemptively, that doesn't count. This is more you're taking it for symptoms. Um, if you're waking up two or more times a month, you might not be controlled. Um, if you're refilling your rescue inhaler prescription more than two times per year, or if your asthma is getting in the way of usual activities that you do, like going to school or work, um, then you're not controlled. And 
when your asthma is controlled, you are, that also means that you're living your life the way you want to live it. You're not missing school or work. You're not missing activities with your friends. You can go hiking, you can play sports. You can do all of the things that you want to do um, without your asthma being a limitation. Um, and then Healthy Lifestyles is also is giving points for people that do the asthma control test. And that's also another way to know if you're controlled or uncontrolled. Um, but these these things are just easy ways that um, you can figure out how controlled you are. Um, most people think they're under control. Um, but after reading these, they know that they might not be just because they're so used to living with their symptoms. Um, so this is just kind of like the easiest way to figure out if you might be uncontrolled or not. Um, there are consequences to not being controlled. Um, one of the biggest things um, with asthma is, is an expensive disease. Um, you know, the medications are expensive. Um, hospital visits, doctor's visits, all that, but also the indirect costs like missing school and missing work. Um, there was a study done um, and in that study, they saw that children miss uh, six school days in a six month period um, compared to the students that didn't have asthma, which was only 2.6 missed school days. Uh, and that adds up um, and that's kind of just the average. So there's people that are missing a lot more school. Uh, and then same with adults, um, adults that have asthma miss five days of work versus the 1.5 days that their peers were missing. Um, so this is huge, especially like if you are a parent of someone, a child that has asthma, not only is your child missing school, but you're also missing work, uh, trying to take care of them. So that's why we push having people be, uh, better controlled. Okay. Um, so why is it important to control your asthma? Um, uncontrolled asthma can lead to problems kind of in every aspect of your life. Um, one of the big ones is work because, again, that's where you're spending a lot of your time and it can reduce work productivity by more than a third. Um, there was a study um, that showed that there's a big impact also on the emotional well-being of people at work. If they're coughing all the time, um, if you're tired, if you're feeling weak, it can, you know, it's mental strain it can really have a significant impact on the quality of work that you're able to do. Um, and in another study, they showed um, participants described feeling depression, stress, embarrassment, helpless, and guilt um, because their asthma was um, causing issues with them at work. And this would also go to kids at school. If kids are missing a lot of school, they're falling behind, that can lead to a lot of stress with kids there, um, especially with COVID, a lot of kids are already um, behind. And if they're missing even more school, then this can be very stressful for them. Um, okay, so this is what, this is an asthma action plan. I don't know how many people have heard of one. Um, most of the people we talk to uh, don't have an asthma action plan. Um, but this is just a form that we have or want people to fill out. There's three sections. Um, the first section is a green section. Um, and here you would write down um, everything that um, you would do if you are doing well. So you write down like your controller medication, uh, the one that you take every day, even if you're feeling well. It has a spot for like the dose uh, when you take it. Um, you would put in triggers just because you, even if you're feeling well, you want to avoid those. Um, and then if you need to take any quick relief medication before being exposed to a trigger. So this is like basically instructions on what to do if you're feeling well. The yellow zone um, is caution. So you're having symptoms. So if you have symptoms, you would write down everything that you would do um, if, um, if you have present with those symptoms. Um, and then the red zone is emergency. So it has a spot for all the emergency symptoms that you could experience. And then instructions on what to do if you're experiencing any of that. Um, and the reason that we ask people to fill out an asthma action plan, and we usually ask them to do it, they can do it with their family, but also we encourage them to do it with their medical provider. 
um, is just because this helps uh, people around you know what to do. So for a child who would tell parents to give a copy of this plan to their teachers, to their daycare providers, school nurses, um, any of like their fa or their friends' family, um, so that if they do have an asthma attack when you're not with them, that other people could be as helpful as if you were there. Um, for adults, we always tell them to share this also with like family or friends that they spend a lot of time with, but also, um, you know, having a copy at work or uh, giving a copy to maybe like their um, work manager, just because um, we want to make sure that people around you know how to better help you um, when you are struggling to breathe. So we definitely push this. We can send um, have Brooke uh, share a copy with everyone. Um, and, you know, you, we just always say it's better to just um, be better prepared. And this is just another step to that. Okay. So some of the most common barriers to people having controlled asthma um, would be that they don't remember to take their medication daily, especially if people are feeling good. Um, they don't remember to take their medication or they think I'm fine. I don't need to take it. Um, also the confusion between your controller and your rescue inhaler. Um, a lot of the inhalers look the same. The only difference is they'll be a different color. So your albuterol might be blue, but your controller medication is red, but they look the same. So making sure that you know which of your medications is which and what each of them does. Um, and this is a really good thing to add on your action plan. You wanna put that your quick relief inhaler, what the color is so that, you know, you tell somebody, go get my rescue inhaler they'll know which one it is. It's the blue one or the red one. Um, another one is that people can't afford their prescriptions. And this is one of the most common barriers that we run across. Um, if this is um, the case, go ahead and reach out to us. We have a lot of resources um, for different um, prescriptions, um, websites, and things like that that can help you to find it um, at a reasonable cost. Um, another one is that they don't understand um, their inhaler technique. Um, I've been doing this now for almost a year and a half, and I think the only person that we've seen have perfect inhaler technique was one nine-year-old girl. Um, everybody else that we talk to, there's always something that they can improve, um, whether that's um, cleaning their inhaler, making sure they're taking it the right way, making sure that they're waiting the right amount of time in between the rescue inhaler puffs. So you wanna make sure that you're, you're following the instructions on your inhaler. Um, another one like Jocelyn had mentioned before is understanding your triggers. Um, because there are so many triggers, um, people don't always recognize what they are. We've had people that were going through the presentation and like, oh, I just thought I coughed. I didn't realize that that was a trigger. Um, and then barriers to removing the triggers. Um, if you have a child who's allergic to dogs and the dog sleeps in the child's bed, that could be a barrier for them having controlled asthma and they're waking up a lot at night. Um, but we go over some different techniques to removing barriers. Um, and just so you know, it never involves getting rid of a pet or an animal. Uh, but there are different um, suggestions that we can have that maybe people hadn't thought of before to overcoming those barriers. Okay, so um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we work for the Asthma Home Visiting Program. And one of our, like, um, I guess the point of this whole program is to help people with uncontrolled asthma. So we are constantly helping them remove those barriers that we just spoke of. Um, the way the program works is we do three home visits. Um, the first visit, we go over um, symptoms, um, medications, inhaler technique. We really focus on the inhaler technique just because. Um, it definitely makes a difference. Um, and then we kind of try to get to know your asthma a little bit better just so we know how to help you. Um, and then during the second visit, we do kind of a home environment assessment. We identify um, asthma triggers. We help you identify those as well. We set goals. Um, we do like a home walkthrough just so that we can see what, what different things in your home you could work on. Um, 
to remove those triggers. And then the third visit is just kind of a follow up, uh, just making sure that there is progress and that you are doing better. And then we do a few follow up calls throughout the year. Um, our visits are done in English or in Spanish. Um, if there is any other language um, necessary, we do have a connection to translation services so that we can help with that. Um, and then also we are pretty flexible. So this is a home visiting program, but we know with COVID things are a little trickier. So we do virtual visits. And then also um, with a lot of like, the county employees, we can always go to your workplace as well if you have an office or you can come to our office as well, just so that you know, um, it's easier for you and more manageable to get this um, education. Okay, so the eligibility criteria for the program um, is if you take an asthma control test and your score is 19 or below, that's kind of an indicator that your asthma isn't as well controlled as it could be. Um, for little kids, um, we have what's called the test for respiratory and asthma controlling kids, and that would be a score of 80 or less, and that's out of 100 points. Um, or if you have any of the following in the past 12 months, if you've gone to the emergency room or been hospitalized for your asthma, if you have taken oral steroids like prednisone for your asthma in the last 12 months, or if you've had an unscheduled doctor's visit for asthma or an urgent care visit, these are all things that would qualify someone for the home visiting program. Um, and then to add to that, um, I always forget this, but there is no income, income requirements or uh, age requirements. So we are helping people, children that are like six years old, but then we're also helping people that are 60 years old. So. Um, it does not matter what age you are, as long as you have uncontrolled asthma, we can help. And then it, it is a completely free program. Um, I always tend to forget that part. I don't know why, but it's probably the most important one. So it's completely free to you. Um, all you would need is just to um, allow us to come and give, provide some education. And then we do the rest. Um, so our program works. Uh, we've been doing this program for about six years. And um, the people that participate in the program, completed the program, have seen 75% less asthma-related emergency room visits. They've seen 87% less asthma-related hospitalizations. Um, this is very applicable to you guys, but um, people have missed, are uh, seen 80% less missed work days and 51 less missed school days, which is super great numbers. And then also the people that um, completed the program, 87% uh, of those people maintained asthma control after a year of completing the program. So our um, whole job is to make sure that not only do you have the education to be better controlled, but that you stay controlled for years to come, that this isn't just like you're controlled while you're here, but even we provide the, the tools for you to be um, controlled for the rest of your life. Okay, so these are just our contact information. Um, we, if you want to take a picture of it, we can also send it. I can provide that for you guys as well. The call um, number is just our landline, but the text one you can call us on there as well. Um, and you can always reach out to us with any questions or if you want to set up a, a visit. Um, we would only require a few questions us to require. It would only require us to ask you guys a few questions and then um, we can set up that appointment. Um, but yeah, does anyone have any questions? I know that was a lot of information um, and in the visits we provide more detailed information. Um, but yeah, does anyone have any questions for us? Okay, great. Well, we'll make sure to send um, Brooke some of those, um, the, the asthma action plan, um, and then the link of the video so you guys can watch that as well. Um, and then anything else that I can think of that would be beneficial for you guys. Um, but thank you. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. And thank you so much, Brittany. That was such an awesome presentation. I feel like we just gained so much information and, and there's so many 
great resources, especially for those who do have asthma, or maybe you don't, and now you know. <laughs> you know, now you can figure it out and get the help that you need. So I think that's awesome. Um, I see in the chat someone was asking if you could also send the natural cleaning recipes. Yes, we'll provide that as well. Perfect. So I'll look out for an email and then I can send that out to all of those who participated today. So be sure to, um, again, sign in for your healthy lifestyles points and then that's how I'll know who came today and I can send out that information to them. So thank you so much.